Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World, and uh, a lot of you saw that uh, recently there was a settlement in the uh, the infamous case of the Central Park Five. Uh, these were five young men uh, who were all teenagers at the time who were accused of, of raping a woman um, uh, by the name of Tricia Maley uh, back in uh, 1989. And the case um, really kind of became a poster child of false accusations that occur uh, I believe somewhat systematically, somewhat regularly in the criminal justice system, particularly as it pertains to black men. Uh, the men got a settlement of $40 million, uh, which uh, is, is you know kind of bittersweet for them because, as you know, it's 2014, so you're talking about 25 years later. Um, and I wanted to get some perspective on just not just this case, but really this case in the context of of what happens with black men in the criminal justice system, uh, you know, how are how are individuals falsely accused uh, in this way? Uh, how are they coerced into their confession? So I reached out to uh, just somebody that I just respect so much, someone that you have heard from in the past. Uh, her name is Dr. Chanel Jones. Uh, she is a criminology expert and, and a professor at Ohio Dominican University. So I want to ask Dr. Jones, how are you doing today? Always good, 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 especially on this Saturday. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I was. I was joking. I was joking with Dr. Jones before about the fact that um, you know only I am nerdy enough to think that people have nothing to do on a Saturday night. But you know what? Justice calls, and you know I. Th I think of you as the, as the great black scholar you are. You're like a superhero for the black community. You you know we, people need us. They need our expertise, and it's up to us to like go when duty calls. So I hope that that pepped you up enough to make you uh, not think I'm too much of a weirdo for calling you on Saturday night. No, 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 you're fine, you're fine. Okay, okay, well, well, I, well I, I so appreciate you because um, your insight is extraordinary. You're right there, um, you're right, you don't, you're not, you don't live too far away from um, Michelle Alexander, who's another uh, black female scholar uh, who does the kind of work that you do, who fights for justice, and I, I just respect both of you so much because I think that these warrior scholars, these uh, people that really get out there for our people are just so valuable. Um, I know they are to me. And um, so there you go. I just have to keep saying thank you for that. Um, now, let me ask you this. Um, you and I both talked. We both saw the documentary, The Central Park Five, and right. they really broke down, which which I recommend to everybody. It's, it's a great film. I mean, a great film that really just breaks down what happened, how these kids were, uh, how they how they were interrogated in a way that led that, that basically misled them into confessing to things they did not do. Um, they were lied to consistently, um, you know, and it really made me more curious about just what happens and how these sorts of uh, false allegations occur. Uh, first of all, let me ask you this. As, as an expert of criminology, um, do you think that the Central Park Five case is kind of just this anomaly that only happens once every blue moon? I mean, I've actually heard people say that, um, that you know, that false allegations are so rare that they shouldn't even be discussed. Um, is, is this a regular thing or is this something that just happens uh, only once in a million years. No, false. Uh, excuse me. False accusations occur more often uh, than we actually think. The problem is we rarely hear about it unless it's one of these, you know, media, you know, prominent cases um, that that gets a lot of attention. But it does happen uh, more often than we would we would anticipate and um wrongful convictions because ultimately this was a wrongful conviction wrongful convictions occur a lot too i think uh, the latest study happened in like 2012 somewhere around 50 percent of wrongful convictions involved african americans so when we think about the prevalence and how often this happens it, it happens a lot and uh, reasons for that usually center on when we think of African Americans and particularly the African American male, you know, on a societal level, they often symbolize everything that is deviant, everything that is criminal, everything that is wrong, everything that is bad. So it is easier to use an African American, particularly an African American male, as a scapegoat for a crime that happens. And, and this happened in this case. And, you know, we can go back and think about several other cases and we can look at uh, the historical ideology of um, wrongful convictions and who are involved in wrongful, wrongful convictions, we can date it back to 1931 with the Scottsboro Boys, or we can date it as recently as what's going on now. Um, but the fact of the matter is, even if they were awarded, I think they were awarded $40 million in, you know, for this case, 
they miss a significant portion of their childhood and young adult lives that they cannot get back. And sometimes I question whether or not 40 million is even enough to compensate for that because it has to be divided amongst all of them. And not only that, you know, I really think we should go look into the prosecutorial process here and see what was done on that end and whether or not there should be criminal charges filed against the prosecutors who actually pursued this case and pretty much misled these kids and coerced them into a confession. So there are multiple issues here um, that are just wrong. And so those are my thoughts about this. But in terms of how often does it happen, it all, it happens a lot. It really does. Hmm. Interesting. Well, you know, it, it's so funny. You, 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 you brought up so many points that, that triggered thoughts in my mind. Um, first of all, I, I think for us to really understand and try to empathize with how someone might feel by being falsely incarcerated for that long. Now, mind you, uh, the uh, the longest defendant, the, all the men served uh, between seven and thirteen years in prison. Um, the longest defendant actually did thirteen years. So I think that in, for, in order for us to understand, um, you know, the, the the settlement in the context of what these men lost, I think we should ask ourselves. I mean, how much would someone have to pay you to uh, give up the next decade of your life? Like if someone offered you $20 million to be in prison for 10 more years, would you take it? Or, or $30 million? I mean, what amount would, would, would you be willing to take in exchange for that much lost time in your life? And I think a lot of people uh, wouldn't take any amount of money. I mean, especially, you know, I always use this example with my students to t help them understand how valuable their youth is. And I say, um, what if I put you in a machine and I put myself in another machine and, uh, and I hit a button and when we woke up, I was 22 and you were 42. Uh, how much money would it cost you, cost me to convince you to get into that machine and instantly become a 42 year old tomorrow? And none of the students almost ever take, agree to any amount of money because what they lost is so valuable. And then you think about the 40 million, you're right, it's being split up amongst uh, all five of them. But then also the lawyers are going to take a big chunk. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're worse than the IRS. And then after the lawyers come in and take their chunk, the real IRS is going to come in and take a bigger chunk. So you're not talking about $40 million going to one person. You're probably talking about more like maybe two to four million uh, after taxes and after attorney's fees and everything else. So it's, it's really not a good trade off, if you ask me. The third point that I love that you made that I certainly agree with is um, somebody needs to go to prison for this crap. I mean, when, when you send somebody, when you destroy somebody's life like that, and it is determined that your misconduct led to that person losing that much of their life, you should go to prison. You should be prosecuted. I don't understand that. And the only conclusion that we can come to is one that Dr. Wilmer Leon um, brought to me the other day. It was very basic, but I said, oh, my God, I think you've actually awakened something here. Um, he said that he's a historian now, and he said all throughout America's history, black people have never been considered human. And he said that you know part of the reason that it's so easy for people to take away years of our life, um, to falsely accuse us of things, to harm us and not be forced to pay the consequences is because people don't see the loss of a black life as the loss of a human life. You know, it, it, and you think about that. I mean, what if I go out and I kill a, you know I kill a bunch of a bunch of chickens or a bunch of cats? You know, people would say, yeah, he deserves to be punished, but he doesn't de deserve the death penalty because it's not like he killed a real person. So you have to wonder if, if our humanity is, is actually respected in the society. Um, now, okay, so uh, first of all, you know, when you watch the documentary, kind of being an expert on criminology, and you're, and you're looking at this system and you're kind of seeing the things that are wrong with it, uh, you know more about the system than almost anybody I know. Um, you know, are there any, I mean, are there things that, that we can kind of talk about and really zoom in on to kind of help us at least have a template of what the system should look like if it were to ever be fair? I mean, is a fair criminal justice system even really a possibility in our lifetime? You know, I, ooh, uh, I, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I, I honestly don't. I, I feel like that's an oxymoron that is a like fair in criminal justice. And, you know, it's just because of the sh very structure of the system. I, I really don't know if we can ever get to that point. And, you know, I think the reason why people allow it to, go on and allow these wrongful convictions to go on for so long is because we operate off of a utilitarian perspective, whereas the justice is more right more times than it is wrong, so then people excuse it for the greater good of the community, when in fact, 
you know, and the, the, the system does need to be overhauled. And if we think about it, um, we can go historically back. I think it was the case of Susan Smith who murdered her two children and then she blamed it on the African-American man. And then we had the case of Bethany Storo who actually threw acid on her face and blamed it on an African-American woman. We can also talk about Charles and Carol Stewart. Charles actually murdered his pregnant wife, blamed it on an African-American man. I mean, repeatedly, we consistently hear these stories over and over and over again of how um, white people commit crimes and then they blame it they use uh, African Americans as a scapegoat and that goes to that issue of the devalued life of you know not thinking anything of it thinking of African Americans as disposable we put them in the criminal justice system you know they're already not human so it doesn't even matter what happens to them I mean this this is a pervasive problem that needs to be uh, addressed and if we can get to the point where the system is 100 percent free of wrongful convictions and those sorts of issues. I I don't know if we can actually get to that point. It, it, it's so tricky and there's so many different variables to be considered with this. Um, but the problem is um, with all of these happening and what we find there is little consequences after the fact. So after the person admitted, yeah, I lied. Yes, I ruined this person's life. We hear, I'm sorry. And then that's pretty much it. We don't see a consequence for the person who actually raped or lied on the person and caused, you know, African Americans to be sentenced to jail. So, you know, that's why I say with um, this whole Central Park Five case, uh, we really do need to look into the prosecution and whether or not, you know, the system can be repaired. I don't know. If somebody has any ideas, I would be wonderfully open to hearing them. <laughs> well, well I, I want people to email us and, and, you know, please share your thoughts on this. I, you know, and, and our, our forum in Your Black World is pretty open to anybody that has something to say. I mean, we're two scholars who are speaking, but the space is open for anybody that has ideas um, and thoughts. And I, I love to hear from scholars and legal professionals because I think that they're needed in this fight. But there are also people – I've met scholars who uh, didn't go to school. You know, I've met I met uh, a couple of guys who uh, Dar uh, one's in Daryl Pageant, the other one's Yorima Karama, uh, both of whom did uh, over twenty years on drug charges, and and it was interesting. Um, you know, Yorima he lives right there in Ohio where you live, and he, um, you know, and Yorima's judge literally when he gave him his sentence, he wrote on the judgment, "I want to make it clear that I do not want to give this young man this this many years." Um, I have to do it because I have no uh, no leeway here, and I know the laws are going to eventually be changed. And I just want to make sure that, for the record, it is known that I am not uh, I am not uh, interested in giving this man this much time because he doesn't deserve it. And I think that that just shows you that there are even people inside the system who think that the system is wrong. Um, and you know, one thing that that crossed my mind, um, and I want to ask you about this, Doctor Jones, is um, you know, if, if if I'm, it seems to me that the greatest victims of false accusations, uh, not all the time, but in many cases, are those who are most vulnerable, right? And mm -hmm. the ones who might be most vulnerable, I imagine, are people maybe who've made mistakes in the past, maybe that person with a criminal record, uh, et cetera, especially when you see the political pressure the, uh, to, you know, on police to make an arrest. You know, rich white woman gets killed, the community's outraged, they've got to lock somebody up. Well, who do they go? Who do they go get? They go get so and so who already has a you know has a criminal record. Maybe he's living at his mama's house and he has a clean alibi. He even has proof that he wasn't there on the night in question. But yet they're still able to arrest him and convict that person. And it seems to me that and you can help help me uh, understand if I'm, I'm 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 anywhere in the ballpark on this. It seems to me that one of the fundamental mistakes that we make in our society is that. We assume that criminals are always lying, that, that criminals meaning people who have a record, that that person with a record is always lying, and that the police officer is always telling the truth. Now, you and I both know enough police officers to know that there's a mix. There are great cops, and then there are not so good cops, right? My dad was a cop for 25 years, and I always have the utmost respect for good law enforcement officers, but we know that there are some who lie. There are some who abuse their authority. There are some who literally make the police department into the biggest gang in the city. Right. Um, so what do you think about that assumption? It seems that race is also linked there, too. If you've got this white police officer, uh, you know, who's never been brought up on disciplinary action saying, you know, this this guy did it and look at his record. He's he's done these other things. Um, it seems that that really just puts the burden of proof so heavily against the defendant that he's almost always at least going to have to take a plea deal. I mean, is that kind of what what we're looking at here? 
Well, we're looking at that, and we're also looking at issues of poverty. Of course, we have race, but, you know, poverty plays a a part in that, and then also with the prior record. So if you have somebody with a prior record, more than likely they're having a difficult time getting a job. So if they're having a difficult time getting a job, they may have more free time to do whatever. And so that then puts them in an area where, let's say, a crime does happen that is in close proximity, that person is there, then we automatically just accuse or assume that they were involved because they had a tainted record in the past. So now we're dealing with, because they had a tainted record, they already are stigmatized, you know, and thought to, hey, possibly be predisposed to committing a crime again. Then you add on the element of poverty, or let's say they're even from a low socioeconomic status where they can't afford good defense, they can't afford a good attorney. Well, then they're going to have poor legal representation when they get involved with the criminal justice system. If they have poor legal representation and when they're involved in the criminal justice system, well, then naturally, you know, you put them up against, let's say, a white woman or some white person who has accused them of committing a crime that has the public behind them, who has, you know, legal funds and defense private attorneys, uh, prosecute or private attorneys against them. I mean, you have these adamant prosecutors who have pressures by the overall public and the media, you know, you pretty much already have this vulnerable person pretty much already lost the case before the case even started. And so what we have is that problem happening over and over again. And of course, you know, more times than not, we have African Americans who are in situations of low economic status or poverty. And then they become involved in the criminal justice system. I mean, it's it's just like a vicious cycle that keeps continuing. And so that's why I always encourage people, you know, go to law school, become scholars and legal scholars and whatnot, so that way we have a strong force of legal representation when things like this happen. So we don't have our young black men and young black women being forced into taking plea deals and saying, hey, I committed this crime, when in fact they didn't, but they're forced to do it because they have poor legal representation, because they can't provide or afford anything better than that. So all of these issues are intertwined and, you know, it, it does speak to, I, I'd say we're we're talking about this um, Central Park Five case, but it speaks to so many other issues and problems within the American criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and um, I, you know, I just want to say that, that you know, God bless these guys that went through this. Um, you know, I it just I think the fact that they were they're kind of close to my age also affected me. Um, you know, because I, I just I could see and feel and smell that era, that time period where this all happened. And, you know, how I would have reacted to that as a teenager. And, um, you know, and just, you know, and I've seen so many cases where cops uh, have just lied, you know, uh, or I've seen them where they've told someone one thing and did something totally different. And there certainly should be accountability um, there. I think that that's, that's certainly not too much to ask. And I also think that people should understand that if you think that, that these cases that are being revealed as false convictions, if you think that that is the majority of the false convictions that are in the system, you're out of your mind. Um, you know, the scary thing to me is that it's not the, the false convictions that we hear about, it's the ones that we don't hear about. You know, I think, you know what I mean? I think the ones we hear about are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, right. You know, the, the iceberg is actually all those people that are in prison uh, who shouldn't be there. And I think that's something we have to fight on. Right, there was a, um, and just piggybacking on, you just talked about the prevalence of, of false rape conditions. I, I just wanted to put this out about, um, I think it was Free and Roosting in 20, 2012. They did a study on wrongful convictions. And I think they studied over 300 cases from the 70s all the way up until 2008. And they found a couple of interesting, um, there was a couple of interesting results from their study. The number one is that most wrongful convictions um, actually occurred in Texas, Illinois, and Ohio. That was one of the interesting findings. The other interesting findings were that 90% of the wrongful convictions involving rape and sexual assault dealt with witness issues that involved cross-racial or incorrect cross-racial references. In other words, they were either a white person saying that a black person raped me or sexually saw me or a black male did it when in fact that did not even happen. So when we talk about how often does this occur, it occurs a lot. And the problem is it doesn't get much media attention. People typically don't talk about it and discuss it, but there is a pervasive problem and it all ties back to that stigma of criminality that is usually ascribed to African Americans and particularly African American men. Um, you, you, okay, I'm done.
no more talking. We're dropping the mic and walking off the stage <laughs> with that because, you know, it, and, and I'm, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm going to be serious here. Um, that just floored me because, um, you know, I, I guess because I've been a black man for so long now, I am, you, you know, particularly sensitive to the fact that so many, that this happens to so many people, particularly black men, and no one wants to talk about it. And, you know, as you know, uh, I got some pushback on the fact that I brought this up. And I think that if you're going to lay out all these other political agendas with other groups and their important issues, uh, you better not sweep black men under the bus. You know, that's just not going to be allowed to happen. You're not going to sweep black women under the bus. Um, we, you know, these issues need to be brought up. And I'm so happy that, that you're bringing them up. Now, tell me one more time. what Who did that study again? I, it was free and ruthless. That's F R E E R E U S I N K in 2012. Okay, S I N K. Yes, S I N K. It's a study on wrongful convictions. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm going to look that study up uh, right after we're done talking, and I hope other people will do the same thing. And I hope people will also look you up because. Um, you are the truth, and I appreciate you for speaking the truth. Um, thank you very much for the work that you do, Dr. Jones. You're very welcome. And uh, thank you all uh, for checking us out at yourblackworld.net. So let's continue the good fight, and uh, thank you for hanging out with us again. So until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. We are gone. Peace.